I always believed that I would find my true love and that it would last forever. However, over time, I came to realize that this was just an illusion. While some people do find each other and stay together into old age, such cases are rare exceptions. My fiancé betrayed me by cheating with my friend in her bedroom, and then she tried to reconcile with me. Timothy made his way to the apartment he shared with Kelly. They had met in high school, and he was immediately captivated by her. When he asked her out, she agreed, and they started dating. Tim was deeply in love with Kelly, she was the first and only girl he had ever kissed. He never dated anyone else because he was so enchanted by her. They dated for a long time before becoming intimate, making Kelly the only girl he had ever slept with as well. They went to college together and continued their relationship throughout their college years. After graduation, they both found jobs, bought a condo, and moved in together. Kelly's parents helped with the down payment for the condo, so it was in her name. They started their careers and began planning their wedding. Tim bought her a stunning diamond engagement ring and felt like life couldn't be more perfect. One Friday, Tim managed to leave work early, so he picked up some chocolates and flowers and got takeout from Kelly's favorite restaurant. He wanted to surprise her and show her how much he loved her. He entered the apartment, put flowers in a vase, and food in the kitchen. Then he heard some sounds coming from their bedroom. He walked down the hall and looked into the bedroom where he saw Kelly and his friend Greg. They were standing with their backs to the door so they didn't notice him. Tim stood in shock, watching his fiancée cheat on him with his friend. The most terrible thing is that during this, they both said unpleasant words to Tim, this weakling won't be home for another hour or two, so we'll have plenty of fun. Tim stood there, unable to believe or comprehend what was happening, tears streaming down his face. They finished and lay down on the bed, and only then did they finally see Tim standing in the bedroom doorway, tears streaming down his face. Greg grinned, and Kelly lay there, not understanding anything. She didn't even have a sense of embarrassment. Tim stood speechless. Eventually, Greg broke the silence, Dude, you must really want to clean up after me since you're doing this. Why don't you take care of the consequences on her part as well? Tim cried and asked, How could you betray me like that? Kelly grinned as she replied, It was easy. I just let him have his way. I loved you. I thought you loved me. He brought me more joy in an hour than you did in a week. There's no way I can marry you now. Make sure you don't knock on the door when you leave. Greg chimed in again, she's actually quite talented. It's a pity you didn't figure it out. Tears were still streaming down Tim's face. Where should I go? I don't care. Just get your stuff out of my apartment. Tim went into the wardrobe to collect his clothes and came out with a full armful. Reacting quickly, he loaded his belongings, computer, and personal belongings into the car. Despite the numerous photos in which he was captured with Kelly, he left them, tearing them up and throwing them away. When he left, he threw away the flowers and food. Noticing a young woman nearby, he handed her chocolates with a smile before driving aimlessly away. He eventually stopped at the park for a takeaway snack. Although he lacked the usual taste, he thought about taking refuge with a friend but hesitated because of possible questions. He eventually stayed overnight at a motel, using his computer to search for affordable housing options. He possessed a modest checking account predating the establishment of a joint account with Kelly. He then transferred the equivalent of his last paycheck from their shared account to his individual one. While he could have emptied the joint account, he refrained from such vindictive action. Additionally, he updated his company's HR system to redirect his direct deposit to his personal account. That night, sleep eluded him as thoughts of Kelly's betrayal consumed him. He had envisioned a future entwined with her but now faced the reality of a life without her. Countless plans of shared experiences lay shattered. Tim pondered whether he could ever trust another woman after this breach of trust. Exhaustion eventually overtook him, though his sleep was troubled, interrupted by tearful awakenings. He felt ashamed of his tears, viewing them as incongruent with his masculinity. Yet, Kelly's betrayal left him questioning his sense of self. The following morning, upon waking he showered and embarked on the quest to secure accommodation. 
After scouting several potential options, he found most to be either unappealing or situated in unsafe neighborhoods. Eventually, he stumbled upon a set of three duplexes. Though modest in size, the unit was tidy and furnished. Having departed with only his essentials, he lacked furniture and preferred not to incur additional expenses. Moreover, he had no intention of reclaiming items purchased during his time with Kelly. Among the apartments, one stood vacant and pristine. After issuing a check, the landlord granted immediate occupancy. With all his belongings confined to his car, Tin began transferring them into his new abode. In the midst of this, he received a text from Kelly accusing him of depleting their joint account. Upon checking online, he discovered she had indeed emptied it. He surmised she was irate because she had intended to do so first, but he managed to withdraw some funds beforehand. Tim never really got the hang of cooking, and Kelly wasn't much of a cook either. They often relied on eating out or getting takeout. Tim realized this was putting a strain on his finances, so he decided to visit the grocery store and pick up some pre-made meals he could microwave. He also grabbed simple items like pasta and jars of sauce for easy cooking. Since he had previously lived in a dorm or with his parents, Tim was ill-prepared for living independently. He had to buy essentials like sheets, towels, pots, tableware, and dishes from a discount store to keep costs down. He charged it all to his credit card, hoping to pay it off quickly. While settling into his new place, Tim noticed the person living in the other half of his duplex, a cute young woman with strawberry blonde hair. She seemed embarrassed when he saw her and quickly looked away. Despite finding her attractive, Tim was still recovering from his breakup with Kelly and didn't feel inclined to pursue anyone new. On Saturday and Sunday, Tim settled into his new place surprisingly well. Instead of dwelling on Kelly, he found himself occasionally thinking about his charming neighbor. However, he didn't dwell on it much, feeling too emotionally drained to pursue any romantic involvement, and she didn't seem interested anyway. While waiting for his internet to be installed, he relied on places with free Wi-Fi. Tim promptly removed any mention of Kelly from his social media profiles and informed his family about the situation. Most offered sympathy, though his brother hinted that if Tim had treated Kelly better, she wouldn't have strayed. Tim later discovered that his brother had been involved with Kelly as well. When Kelly texted him suggesting he'd be more accommodating to win her back, Tim restrained himself from responding rudely and simply stated he wasn't ready for that. He suspected her idea of accommodating involved tolerating her infidelity, which he wasn't willing to do. On Monday morning, Tim encountered his strawberry blonde neighbor as they both left for work. He greeted her with a smile and a nod, but she responded with a weak smile and hurried to her car. While he didn't expect a warm reception, her skittish demeanor caught him off guard. Though he wasn't ready to date, Tim hoped to maintain a friendly rapport. Six months prior, Sarah was content. Jeff appeared to be a pleasant individual, exceedingly attractive, and seemed genuinely interested in her. Additionally, he possessed wealth. Although Sarah didn't prioritize material wealth, her desire was for a genuine connection with someone who valued her for herself. Jeff's words and actions aligned with her hopes, and when he asked her out, she was ecstatic. Jeff arrived at her residence in his gleaming new BMW to fetch her. He pressed the doorbell, greeted her with a kiss on the cheek, complimented her appearance, and presented her with flowers, which she promptly placed in a vase before departing. Escorting her to his car, he courteously opened the door for her. They drove to a fine dining establishment where he utilized valet parking before escorting her inside. Having made prior reservations, they were promptly seated, with Jeff gallantly pulling out Sarah's chair for her. He selected a fine bottle of wine for them, and despite Sarah rarely indulging, she found it difficult to decline a glass. Throughout the meal, he continuously refilled her glass, despite her polite attempts to decline. Nevertheless, not wanting to appear ungrateful, she consumed it. The wine, however, had a significant effect, leaving Sarah feeling quite tipsy by the meal's conclusion, necessitating Jeff's assistance to steady her as they left. Expressing a desire to return home, he drove her back to her residence on Route 6. He advised her to drink water to stave off a potential hangover, offering her a bottle. 
she sipped from it and soon began to feel overwhelmingly tired. When they arrived at her house, he walked her to the door and then said he needed to go to the bathroom. By then, she felt sleepy, so she settled down on the couch with a glass of water while he went to the bathroom. Despite the early hour, she tried her best to keep her eyes open and eventually passed out on the couch. The next morning, she woke up in her bed covered with a blanket. She felt soreness between her legs and couldn't come to her senses. She wasn't going to get intimate on their first date. She suspected that he had given her illegal substances and attacked her. However, she also admitted that she voluntarily let him into her apartment, which would complicate the situation, especially if she was going to go to the police. Realizing what had happened, she cried while taking a shower. After getting dressed, she immediately went to the pharmacy to get emergency contraception, since she did not use any contraceptives. Subsequently, she sought medical help at a polyclinic. After receiving a message from Jeff expressing his desire to meet again in a few weeks, she declined his invitation. Subsequently, she burst into tears, returned to her apartment, and began to disassemble the bed and wash the sheets. In addition, she washed all the clothes she was wearing the night before. Despite a strong desire to burn both clothes and sheets, she refrained from doing so due to financial difficulties. She locked herself in her apartment until Monday, when she went to work. When she arrived at the workplace, she discovered that Jeff was spreading rumors, calling her promiscuous. This was his retribution for the fact that she refused to see him again. As a result, a significant part of the staff began to perceive her negatively, and she found herself surrounded by unwanted advances from numerous men. Many of them were not even ready to treat her to a meal but just wanted to come to her house. She endured constant gossip, and Jeff even shared photos of her. She hoped that the situation would calm down, but when it didn't, she started seeking employment in a different city far from her current workplace. After resigning and relocating a thousand miles away, she settled in affordable accommodation and swiftly found a new job. Now residing in a duplex, she led a solitary life akin to that of a nun. Despite receiving attention from men at her new workplace, she politely rebuffed their advances. Having been deceived by Jeff, she feared encountering a similar man in her new environment. Consequently, she focused primarily on work and solitary activities in her modest apartment, harboring a somewhat cynical view towards men. Present day, Tim gradually adjusted to solitary life. He had been with Kelly since before he left his parents' home, so living alone was a new experience. Although challenging at times, he didn't mind losing touch with many friends from his time with Kelly. He wanted to distance himself from that chapter of his life. Mostly, he focused on work and spent his free time alone in his small duplex. One Saturday, shortly after moving in, he was washing his car when his strawberry blonde neighbor emerged from her place. Tim was still cautious around women but felt it was important to be friendly with his neighbor. As she approached his car, he decided to introduce himself. Hi, I'm Tim, your next-door neighbor. She seemed a bit reserved but replied, I'm Sarah, pronounced C-R-S-A. That's an interesting name. It's Irish, my grandparents were Irish, so I was named in honor of them. Tim had looked into his own ancestry before. Some of my ancestors were Scots-Irish. Sarah's response was matter-of-fact, not hostile. There's a difference between Scots-Irish and Irish-Irish. Sorry, I didn't mean to offend. No problem. Well, nice to meet you, Sarah. I'm just next door if you need anything. I'm good, but thanks. She climbed into her car and drove away. Tim wasn't remotely ready to venture into dating again, but he realized Sarah was even less so, especially with him. Unbeknownst to him, she wasn't just avoiding him. After finishing washing his car, he went inside, took a shower, and grabbed something to eat. About a week later, Tim glanced out of his window to see Sarah struggling with a large box containing a flat-screen television. He hurried outside. Let me help you, Sarah. If it falls, your TV will be ruined, and you wouldn't want that. It's really not necessary. I promise I won't do anything except help you get it indoors, okay? Tim and Sarah each took an end of the box, 
Tim grasping one side while she shifted to hold the other. It wasn't excessively heavy, just bulky enough to make it awkward for one person alone. They managed to transport it up to her door, where they paused for her to unlock and open it. After getting it inside, Tim took a moment to glance around the room, noting its feminine decor, though not overly so. If you ever need a hand with anything else, Sarah, I'm right next door and happy to help. Thank you, Tim. As Tim turned to leave, Sarah spoke up again. Would you mind helping me unpack and set it up? Of course. Carefully unpacking the box, Tim examined its contents before laying it down and gently removing the TV. He also found a tabletop stand, which he assembled and attached to the unit. After connecting it to the cable, he managed to turn it on, and once Sarah turned on her cable box, they had a picture. Thank you, Tim. That would have taken me ages to figure out. It was my pleasure. Well I'll leave you to it, but don't hesitate to ask if you need anything else. Tim departed, though he wouldn't have minded extending his time with her. He still felt unprepared for dating, and she showed no signs of readiness either. Returning to his side of the duplex, Tim felt content with himself. Even if there wasn't any romantic connection between them, at least he had been able to assist someone. Despite her continued distance, she would occasionally offer him a small smile upon seeing him. Tim always greeted her, and she would respond minimally. The more Tim interacted with her, the more he found her endearing, yet he had once believed the same about Kelly, only to realize she didn't reciprocate his feelings. Sarah appeared even more hesitant to engage with Tim than he was with her. This was hardly encouraging from his perspective, although he wasn't certain what signs to look for. She rarely, if ever, sought his assistance, although he would sometimes observe her struggling with something and offer to help. One day, he stepped out to pick something up just as Sarah arrived. She was in tears, trembling as she exited the car. He'd never seen her in such a state and was taken aback, but his instinct to offer support kicked in swiftly. What's wrong, Sarah? It's nothing. It can't be nothing, not with you crying like this. It's a personal issue. I may not be able to fix everything, but I'm here to listen. Tim, I can't possibly tell you about it. Can I at least take you to dinner? No thanks. I've been there before. That's why I'm upset. Said just dinner. I don't know what happened, but I promise I won't make it worse. How can I trust you? Give me a chance to show you. A dinner, but no alcohol and nothing more. Sounds good to me. I'm not much of a drinker, and all I want is a pleasant meal. Give me a few minutes to compose myself, Sarah stepped in for her and stayed for about ten minutes. When she reappeared, she had freshened her makeup and dried her tears. Though not exactly cheerful, she was willing to join Tim for dinner at least. Uncertain, he asked which car they should take, and she agreed to ride in his. Do you have any preference for the restaurant, Sarah? Not particularly. What type of cuisine do you feel like? There was a nearby Italian restaurant in the neighborhood, so Tim decided on that. He thought Italian would appeal to almost anyone. Despite the temptation to guide her by placing his hand on the small of her back as they entered, he refrained, given her somber mood. They were seated promptly, and she sat down before he could pull out her chair for her. The waiter inquired about their drink preferences to which Sarah opted for just water. Glancing at Tim, he echoed her choice, sensing Sarah's aversion to alcohol. He thought it wise. Despite this, he ordered chicken marsala with a marsala wine sauce, mushrooms, and farfalle, while she opted for fettuccine alfredo with chicken, mushrooms, and peas. As they dined, Sarah began to relax a bit, though she remained reticent about what had troubled her. Tim learned that she worked as a paralegal for a small law firm, while he disclosed his job as an accountant at a medium-sized firm. Though he had considered pursuing a CPA, he never felt compelled. Sarah had aspirations of becoming a lawyer but couldn't afford law school. Wanting to comfort her, Tim shared a personal struggle, I faced some tough times myself. I caught my fiancé cheating on me with another man. Are you sure she did it willingly and wasn't coerced? She made her intentions clear and showed disdain for me. 
That's awful. You're charming and seem kind, but even if you were interested, I'm not ready to open up again. I don't want to delve into my issues, but I'm not seeking anything serious either. Perhaps we can just be friends for now. We're neighbors, we can be cordial in passing. Let's leave it at that for now. Tim found himself unsure of his desires. Although he found her attractive and potentially kind, his past experience with Kelly's betrayal made him wary of trusting any woman. Having been closely associated with Kelly for many years, Tim couldn't help but question his ability to judge women if she could deceive him. Sarah also fell victim to Jeff's deception. Initially charming and seemingly sincere, Jeff eventually destroyed her trust. Although Tim seemed nice, Sarah couldn't shake the fear that he might be just like Jeff, manipulative and deceitful. How could she be sure that Tim wasn't just pretending to gain her trust? After Jeff's betrayal, Sarah took drastic measures to break off relations with him, including changing her phone number and limiting contacts only with close relatives and friends. Despite this, Jeff somehow managed to get her new number a few months later and sent the photos, making Sarah feel insulted and vulnerable. He sent the photos to embarrass her and went even further by sharing them with some of her friends and relatives. Tim and Sarah returned to the usual exchange of greetings when their paths crossed and barely communicated with each other. Tim had feelings for her but remained hesitant, while she was extremely cautious, especially after Jeff's recent act. She blocked Jeff's number, and when that wasn't enough, she changed phones and numbers again, this time sharing the new number with only a few family members. Her family urged her to forget about the incident and get on with her life. She assured them that she was doing so, but they insisted on the details of her personal life. She spent a significant amount of time insisting that she took a break from dating. But they insisted. In the end, to calm them down, she announced that she was dating Tim. She gathered enough information about him to make this lie sound plausible, even though it wasn't true. That appeared to appease her family, although they were curious about the progress. She informed them that she and Tim were taking things slowly but would provide them with some fictitious details about their dates. This seemed to satisfy them and keep things under control until her parents announced they were coming to visit and wanted to meet her new boyfriend. Sarah took a deep breath and knocked on Tim's door. I need to ask you a favor. Of course, what do you need? Please come in, Tim said. Sarah entered, though she remained standing. I feel awful. No, you're not, Tim reassured her. I've been deceiving my parents, Sarah confessed. They've been pressuring me to start dating again, and I lied, saying I was dating you. That's not so terrible, Tim replied, beginning to understand. So, you want me to pretend to be your boyfriend for a few days while they're here? They arrive the day after tomorrow and might stay for a week. I like you, and I don't mind pretending to be your boyfriend, but no buts. I just need to know the boundaries. Damn, Tim, I hadn't even considered that. Obviously, nothing too intimate to make it believable. We'll have to hold hands, you'll need to put your arm around me sometimes. Kissing, I suppose, but as long as we don't get carried away, Sarah explained. I certainly don't mind kissing you, Sarah, Tim said with a smile. Just remember, this isn't real, but we have to make it seem real. And it's only while my parents are here. Then we go back to normal. Neither of us is ready for anything serious anyway. Thank you. Is it okay if I hug you? Sarah asked hesitantly. Of course, Tim replied warmly. Tim embraced her, though she seemed uneasy in his arms, keeping it brief. He watched her depart immediately afterward. As Tim pondered the encounter, he realized he shared a similar reluctance to enter into genuine romantic entanglements, much like Sarah. However, they needed to maintain the facade of being a couple. Sarah disliked the idea of pretending to date anyone, even if it was just for show. Yet, she felt trapped. She could have claimed that she and Tim had split, but then she'd have to explain why and risk being pushed into dating someone else despite numerous suitors. Sarah did her best to deter them, although she begrudgingly acknowledged Tim's attractiveness and decency. 
Sarah remained hesitant to let anyone into her emotional space, even the prospect of starting a full relationship chipped away at the protective barrier she'd built around herself. Now she found herself grappling with the consequences of her choices, or perhaps her lack of action. Resigned to the situation, she resolved to endure it for a few days, steeling herself for what lay ahead. Sarah's parents arrived in town, and she and Tim greeted them at the airport. Before her parents arrived, they refrained from showing affection, but the situation became a bit awkward when they felt compelled to appear more intimate. Upon spotting her parents, they held hands and approached them, as if handholding was routine for them. Tim, these are my parents, Liam and Caitlin. We're delighted to meet you, Sarah introduced. Sarah has spoken highly of you. She's a treasure, and I feel fortunate to have her, Tim said, glancing at Sarah. She returned his gaze with a smile before leaning in to kiss him. Tim was taken aback but tried not to show it, reciprocating the kiss instead. After a brief moment of kissing, they broke apart, exchanged smiles, then turned to Sarah's parents. Her mother looked delighted, while her father seemed perplexed. Liam interjected, I was nearly going to suggest you find a room. Sarah and Tim blushed. Caitlin looked at them fondly. Isn't young love beautiful? Liam shook his head at Caitlin. She's twenty-four, not a child anymore. She'll always be my little girl. He adopted a more serious tone. Let's retrieve our luggage and leave. They collected their bags and headed to Tim's car, as it was larger. Sarah, since you both have your own places, why don't we stay at your apartment and let the two of you enjoy some privacy at Tim's? Caitlin suggested swiftly. Tim's mom added, Darling, we've been young once too. We understand how these things go. Why bother with a hotel when you have a spare bed anyway? Sarah was appalled but tried not to show it. What could she do? Admit to her mother that she and Tim weren't actually a couple? That would defeat the purpose of this whole charade. Tim glanced at her. It's fine, love. Just pack enough clothes for a few days. Sarah wanted to strangle both Tim and her parents, but she also needed to keep up the pretense. We don't usually spend the night together, she muttered. When they had a moment alone, Tim said, I'll sleep on the couch, and you can have the bed. I promise I won't make it awkward. My mom already did that, Sarah sighed. I won't make it uncomfortable for you. This is just for show, Tim reassured her. Around that time, her parents arrived. Sarah and Tim put on smiles, even though Sarah was feeling quite unhappy underneath. They decided to dine at a lovely restaurant, the same Italian place Tim and Sarah had visited once before. Liam and Caitlin wanted to order a bottle of wine. Sarah attempted to decline any alcohol, but her mother insisted. We should celebrate your relationship with a good guy, Caitlin urged. I'm not sure I should drink, Mom. You're not pregnant, are you? No, why would you think that? Well, it's not unheard of, and why else wouldn't you be able to drink? I don't really drink much, but okay, just one glass, that's my girl. Sar found herself going further than she had anticipated to maintain her deception. Caitlin and Liam enjoyed their wine, while Tim and Sarah only had one glass each. Caitlin praised Tim, I think my daughter made a good choice in picking you as her boyfriend. Thank you. She's a wonderful person, and I enjoy being with her. Well, Sarah, your dad and I are going to have a good time tonight, and I'm sure you two will too. Sarah's cheeks flushed as she glanced at Tim, who returned her gaze with a subtle nod. He leaned in for a kiss, and she reciprocated. Liam eyed Tim with a hint of disdain. Sarah mentioned your Scots-Irish? Yes, sir, although my ancestors migrated from Ireland many years back. Not my first choice, but at least you're not English, bloody limey jerks, Sarah interjected, addressing Liam. Dad, stop fighting battles from a century ago. They still have a grip on our land. Tim responded to Liam, Sir, we're aware there are both Protestants and Catholics seeking peace and equal treatment in Ireland. Hasn't changed much, has it? For every Ulster volunteer, there's an IRA member, but most people fall somewhere in between. Try telling that to the militias. 
there are friendships across faiths and even interfaith marriages. Not everyone wants to keep Catholics as second-class citizens. Seems like you've done your homework considering your family's history. After meeting Sarah, I felt compelled to educate myself. I suppose that sets you apart from many, Caitlin chimed in. Our daughter assured us he's a good guy. I guess she's right. Sarah remained silent throughout the entire conversation, but as it concluded, she turned to Tim and planted another kiss on him. Their charade of pretending to be a couple appeared to be going better than either had anticipated. However, they still faced the dilemma of spending the night together at Tim's place, neither feeling prepared for anything resembling a physical relationship. After dinner, Liam and Caitlin expressed exhaustion from their travels and opted to rest. Sarah weakly suggested they stay at a hotel. Are you sure? Wouldn't you prefer a hotel? It might be more comfortable, Caitlin promptly dismissed the idea. It'll be nice to have a kitchen and be close by. They then transported the luggage to Sarah's place, with Tim assisting her in gathering clothes to take to his apartment. Observing them, Liam remarked, I'm surprised you don't already have clothes there. Sarah hesitated before responding, I need more than just one change of clothes. They visited Tim's place, where he assisted her in arranging her clothes, making space for them. Tim wasn't particularly keen on fashion, so clearing space was no big deal. Sarah seemed cautious as she settled in, observing her unease. Tim attempted to reassure her, I won't intrude or bother you. I'll simply sleep on the sofa, allowing you to rest comfortably in bed. You seem decent enough, but I've been deceived in the past. I promise I'm nothing like the guys you've known before. That's easy to say. You're only the second woman I've ever kissed, and my ex fiance was the other, she responded playfully. Not bad for someone with limited experience. I have a feeling we have plenty of opportunities to gain experience while your parents are here. Let's stick to just a bit of kissing, holding hands, and occasional hugs, agreed, ma'am. Tim expressed regret for not having laundered the sheets after using them. She indicated that they hadn't anticipated her staying over. He hastily grabbed a pillow and a blanket to settle on the sofa. When there was a knock on the door, they hurriedly concealed everything and found Liam standing there. Where's the thermostat and how do you adjust it? Sarah went to assist him. Upon returning, they both collapsed on the sofa, drained from hours of pretending to be more than they were. Tim began to put his arm around Sarah, then abruptly stopped as he realized what he was doing. She noticed the halted gesture, glanced at him, shook her head, and bit her lip. Tim looked apologetic. We have to be cautious around your parents. You're right, but they're not here now. Once they were confident there wouldn't be any further interruptions, they prepared for bed. Tim, who typically slept in just boxer shorts, opted for a t-shirt and lightweight shorts to be more modest around Sarah. While he changed in the bathroom, she slipped into pajamas in the bedroom. Tim settled onto the sofa, albeit slightly uncomfortable, and managed to get some sleep. He briefly stirred when she got up to use the bathroom during the night but soon drifted back to sleep. Tim rose early, tidying away his bedding in case her parents arrived unexpectedly, as it happened to the DAR. Tim apologized on her behalf and brewed them some coffee. While they sipped their coffee, Sarah emerged from the bedroom. She had swapped her pajamas for a nightshirt. Having overheard them and wanting to avoid any suspicion, Liam and Caitlin expressed interest in exploring the town and spending the day with Tim and Sarah given. That it was Sunday they had little reason to decline. The group of four spent the day together, showing Liam and Caitlin around the city. They enjoyed a pleasant lunch at a quirky nearby spot. For dinner, Caitlin suggested they order in and watch a movie. With Sasa and Tim, they found something suitable on a streaming service. Sasa and Tim naturally gravitated towards each other on the sofa, with Tim draping his arm around her while she rested her hand on his leg, maintaining a respectful distance despite any reservations. Tim found himself growing more comfortable with Sasa, embracing and kissing her, although he still carried some lingering pain from his past relationship with Kelly. Being with Sasa felt unexpectedly right. With limited opportunities for private conversation, Tim was unsure of Sasa's feelings. 
he regretted that their time together was limited to the week while Sasa's parents were visiting, but it was the agreement they had made. After the movie ended, Caitlin addressed Sasa and Tim, I suppose it's time for us to head out, giving you two some space to enjoy yourselves. Liam scoffed in response, even young folks don't necessarily engage in such activities every night. Why do you doubt these two will? It's not guaranteed. Plus, I think you're embarrassing your daughter. Zara indeed blushed at her mother's remark. She hugged her arms around herself and withdrew her hand from Tim's leg. Tim leaned towards Sasa and whispered softly yet audibly, We'll only do what you're comfortable with, when you're comfortable. Liam nodded, then turned to Caitlin. He does seem like a good guy, Caitlin grunted and stood up, followed by Liam. Sasa stood to hug her parents goodbye. Tim shook hands with Liam, who placed his hand on Caitlin's lower back and guided her out the door. Once they were gone, Tim locked the door. Sasa appeared on the verge of tears. I made a mistake by lying to them like that. Now we have to maintain this facade all week. Tim approached and placed his hands on her shoulders. Though it wasn't meant to be intimate, Sasa recoiled slightly. I'm trying to make this as easy as possible. With that, Sasa gave him a quick hug and hurried into the bedroom. Tim sighed, retrieving his shorts and bedding from the closet before heading to the bathroom to change. He turned off the lights and lay down, attempting to rest. He felt conflicted. While he was beginning to feel drawn to Sasa, she still appeared disinterested. He pondered this as he drifted off to sleep. During the day, Sasa and Tim were occupied with work, but they spent their evenings with Caitlin and Liam. This routine persisted throughout the week. Tim devoted plenty of time to holding Sasa and showering her with kisses, yet he found himself sleeping on the sofa while Sasa occupied his bed. Despite his discomfort with the arrangement, Tim felt a pang of sadness knowing their visit would only last a week. They had arrived on a Saturday but opted to depart on a Sunday, granting them some additional time together before heading to the airport. Sasa and Tim shared breakfast and lunch with Caitlin and Liam. Tim and Liam loaded the luggage into the car, and everything seemed to proceed smoothly until Liam pulled Tim aside for a conversation. You two aren't very convincing actors, Liam remarked. What do you mean? Tim inquired. My wife may entertain some wishful thoughts, but I don't. It's quite evident that you and my daughter aren't lovers, and frankly, I doubt you're even a real couple, Liam explained. What gives you that impression? Tim questioned. There are subtle cues in Sasa's behavior, especially when she thinks no one is watching, Liam elaborated. We're not involved romantically, Tim admitted. It's a bit of a pity. You seem like a decent fellow, despite being Scots-Irish, Liam commented. I wouldn't mind if fiction turned into reality, Tim confessed. Best of luck with that. You have my blessing if it happens, Liam responded. Around that time, Caitlin and Sasa approached. Tim drove them to the airport and assisted with checking their bags. Caitlin bid him farewell with a hug, while Liam shook Tim's hand. Sasa and Tim embraced each other as they watched her parents depart. Once they were out of sight, Sasa let out a sigh of relief and released her hold on Tim, though he continued to cling to her. They're gone. We don't need to pretend anymore, Sasa said. I understand you've been hurt, and I'm sorry for what that person did to you. But I believe I've shown that I'm not like them, Tim said. What do you mean? I want to be your genuine boyfriend. For now, we don't have to change anything from what we've been doing this past week, but I want the opportunity to prove myself. That wasn't our agreement. Please give it a chance for a month. I believe I can be the kind of guy you need, and you can be the kind of woman I need. We were meant to pretend to deceive my parents. You deceived your mother, but your father saw through it. Was he angry? Interestingly, I believe he approves of me. You said a month and we only need to engage in simple gestures like holding hands, hugging, and occasional kisses were S-T-R-E-R-S. I don't know you, you don't know me. Don't you think we've discovered things about each other in the past week? But is it sufficient? It's sufficient to begin with. Despite her initial reluctance, Sarah agreed to start a relationship with Tim. 
he was careful not to pressure her, and over time, she seemed to warm up to the idea of him being her boyfriend. Tim respected Sarah's boundaries regarding intimacy, so they focused on enjoying each other's company. As their relationship progressed, Valentine's Day approached. Tim arranged a reservation at a fancy restaurant and bought thoughtful gifts for Sarah, including flowers, chocolate-covered strawberries to match her strawberry blonde hair, and jewelry adorned with garnets, which complemented her style. Sarah was pleasantly surprised by Tim's gestures and appeared slightly shy as she accepted his gifts. Putting on the jewelry, she expressed her gratitude, remarking on Tim's affectionate actions. You seem to like me quite a bit, Tim, she said. I love you and adore your hair. I want you to be my strawberry valentine, he replied. And what does that entail? Whatever you wish it to be. After enjoying a pleasant dinner, they proceeded to dance. Initially, the music consisted mostly of lively tunes until a slow song began playing. Tim drew her close, and Sarah felt herself nearly melting in his embrace. Although Tim had danced similarly with Kelly in the past, it never felt as right as it did with Sarah. As the song came to an end, Tim felt a pang of regret, but then Sarah glanced at him, parting her lips slightly. He leaned in and kissed her, experiencing a sensation unlike any other kiss he'd known. He knew it couldn't last forever, yet he would have been content if it had. After the kiss, all he desired was to kiss her again and again. However, instead of indulging in another kiss, she smiled shyly and guided him off the dance floor. As they left, Sarah grabbed her purse and glanced at him. Tim, I think it's probably time to call it a night. They strolled back to the car, where Tim courteously opened the door for her. She smiled gratefully as she settled into her seat. Tim drove them to their respective apartments. Sarah exited the car as Tim circled around to her side. Sarah, tonight has been amazing. I believe this has been the most remarkable Valentine's Day I've ever experienced. It doesn't have to come to an end just yet, Tim said. I understand what you desire, but I'm not sure I'm prepared for that. It doesn't have to involve anything you're not comfortable with. I've been taken advantage of in the past, you know. I would never treat you that way, Sarah. It has influenced how I view closeness. I only want to do what you're willing to do. Let's cuddle, and if I do anything you're not okay with, just tell me and I'll stop. I'm not sure, Tim. Sarah, I genuinely care about you. Are you hesitant to say love? I was worried that if I said love, you might think I was using it to manipulate you. You wouldn't be the first. Let's just sit and cuddle for a while. Haven't I always respected your boundaries? And you won't push me? I promise. They entered Tim's apartment and settled down on the couch. Sarah refused alcohol but agreed to tea, although she hesitantly accepted the first few cups. Tim, however, confidently took a sip before handing it back. He hugged her, and eventually, they kissed. When his hand reached for more interesting places, she stopped him, showing that she was not ready for this yet. Tim pulled away, instead focusing on her back. Despite his first slip, she didn't mind, and he continued to massage her. She stopped kissing him, pulled away, then got to her feet. He thought that would be the end of it, but then she held out her hand to him. Taking her hand, he stood up, and she led him into the bedroom. Once inside, she turned to face him. We could continue if all you wanted was physical contact. Then let's do it and move on with our lives. I want much more than just physical intimacy. You're my strawberry valentine, and I want you to be mine for a long time. It's easy to say. But it's true. Fewer words, Tim. Okay, come here. Let's get down to business, he said. They woke up the next morning, still clinging to each other. Tim, yesterday was wonderful, but how much of it was real? Valentine's Day may have passed, but I don't want to lose what we found. I meant everything I said, and I want to be with you forever. Some people say that marriage is just a piece of paper. Sarah, I need this piece of paper if it means you're going to be mine. She shivered a little and smiled sweetly at him. I don't know. I might need a little more convincing. 
I'll happily spend the rest of my life convincing you. She rolled over and kissed him. Then let's start right now. Sarah and Tim were planning to get married. They got a marriage license and had a small wedding. About a week before Tim and Sarah's wedding, Kelly called Tim. Tim, I made a mistake. I should never have cheated on you like that. How could you betray me? I should never have been unfaithful to you. You were my one true love. I believed you were my true love until this happened. Please give me another chance. I'm deeply sorry. Kelly, I met someone else. I love her, and we're getting married. She will never be what I was to you. But she won't be unfaithful and flaunt it. I made a mistake. Can you forgive me? It's over, Kelly. I love Sarah, and I'm going to marry her. I hope you find someone you can truly love. I really did love you. If you truly loved me, you would never have been unfaithful. Kelly begged and cried, but it was useless. Tim could never leave Sarah and return to Kelly. Five years later, Tim and Sarah had two beautiful daughters, Maeve and Erin. Maeve has dark hair and is a quiet child, while Erin is a real redhead and very irritable. They have a lovely house, and everyone has good jobs. Sarah works a lot remotely, making it easier to take care of the girls. Caitlin adores her granddaughters and visits them as often as she can. Liam still teases Tim about being Scottish-Irish. Tim still calls Sarah his Strawberry Valentine and tries to make every day like Valentine's Day for her. 